My focus will be on the media strategies um, and how they influence uh, people's perceptions of food culture. So, well, evidently, this is a, a very different um, perspective compared to what uh, Atsuko uh, just uh, presented to us. Uh, but I think, in in a sense, also very complementary uh, for uh, for that matter. Um, <clears throat> When Anant uh, introduced this webinar saying that um, it's a uh, feast's ambition to make it easy for every uh, person in Europe to eat a delicious, healthier and a more sustainable diet. Um, well, that is, of course, quite a challenge if you look at how the media ecosystem and the food ecosystem um, uh, collaborate in um, or cooperate in um, in presenting food cultures to us and that's exactly what i want to um to talk about um so i'll first dive a bit into the the let's say the the um, more economic marketing perspective of media strategies and media as a system and uh, in the second part of the presentation it will be more about the sociological and psychological effects um, of these mostly marketing kind of messages uh, on people and then in the very final slide i believe i'll try to turn it around and think about well how can we um, uh, well with the knowledge we have about the system how can we then do something positive with it um, so, well, I'm afraid that uh, not all of my presentation is uh, is positive. We first have to uh, set the stage uh, and understand what's going on. Um, so, in setting the stage, I, I first want to um, talk to you about uh, the fact that, well, we typically think of um, of paid media as the, the, the strategies of, of advertisers, of food producers. So, if we think about media strategies, we often think about Let's say TV ads. Uh, for the older generation, certainly TV is is a play uh, the place where they uh, have these like impressions of how the big multinationals, the ones that also were referred to by Anand, for instance, um, are advertising to people or are having a lot of media exposure to people. So it started in, in for instance, uh, the the 1980s with Michael Jackson and, and Pepsi, then. 10 years ago, Beyonce had a deal in these Coke wars between Pepsi and Coca-Cola, uh, Taylor Swift, um, uh, sports celebrities, etc. We all know them from TV ads for uh, these multinational food producers. Uh, but uh, of course, also um, the last decade, we, we saw uh, a lot happening on internet, on social media, um, influencer marketing, etc. But these are basically all examples of what we could call um, paid media advertising. So it's where um, these multinationals pay a medium to have their ad on the medium, whether it be a social media ad, an influencer that they pay, a TV ad, etc. But it's also important to already note that uh, paid media extends far beyond these usual suspects. It, it extends far beyond TV, social media ads, etc. Um, for instance, it's also um, something that is, uh, well, um, um, within sponsorship, sponsorship of um, uh, sports teams, but it's also in sponsorship of TV programs, etc. Um, it's also at point of purchase, for instance. So. Um, uh, these multinational uh, food producers are paying or in, in some way um, um, investing in, um, uh, uh, for instance, retailers uh, such that they can get a better shelf position, et cetera, et cetera. So these are all examples of paid media. A second large category that we also need to take into account are owned media. Um, Brands are constantly trying to design and nurture direct communication to customers. Uh, for foods, this is very prominent, for instance, in packaging. Um, packaging, um, well, is something that we think is, is well, uh, a, a direct match with food, of course. But if you think about packaging, you already understand that uh, there's a, a clear imbalance in the food ecos ecosystem that uh, especially the highly processed foods, um, they um, have packaging um, to protect the products, but also uh, to, uh, to, um, uh, to contain some branding, marketing, etc. Whereas in much more healthy um, raw foods, such as fruits and veggies, typically don't have uh, packaging. So they have a deficit in terms of how they can uh, create exposure to uh, to consumers, a deficit that will even uh, increase uh, given that uh, Europe, for instance, will 
um, <coughs> will have um, new le legislation or regulation on um, uh, veggies and fruits uh, that they cannot be packaged anymore in the future. So, um, well, uh, packaging is one example, but there's also different other owned media, so media that the brand owns, where they try to communicate to uh, uh, to people, to consumers. For instance, we also see that major brands have um, lots of um, um, own social media where they have uh, a huge follower audience. Again, a deficit. It's much more difficult to have, let's say, a, a brand of apples having a, a very cool social medium compared to a um, uh, multinational, uh, highly processed food producer. And then a third category um, that we need to uh, understand within the media strategies are earned media. It's all the exposure that you get without you having to do anything for it. It's free exposure coming from other people. Um, and for sure, for food, this is a very important medium uh, type of medium as well, because, for instance, you cannot imagine um, a TV show, uh, a movie, a book, etc., without people eating. Eating is such a an important part of everyday life that, um, well, whenever we talk about um, everyday life or whenever we have a, 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 a cultural communication like a movie, a book or whatever, a TV show about everyday life, uh, we will see um, um, uh, food, we will uh, hear about food, etc. And also people, you and me, we are um, um, talking about food quite a lot. Um, so earned media is a is a very important force as well within the media strategies and um, directly directly or indirectly we see that um, the whole ecosystem around media and food um, indeed focuses on these three different types of media uh, to promote food cultures or to have an effect on uh, food cultures. Um, and. I think it's uh, it's no surprise that indeed uh, the healthy foods, uh, the, the sus more sustainable foods, so let's say uh, raw foods like indeed fruits and veggies, um, have a true uh, deficit on all these three levels. Uh, they don't have a larger profit margin that you see in the ultra-processed foods. So ultra-processed foods typically have higher profit margins, which in turn leads to um, more money to be spent on paid media. It also leads to more money to be spent on owned media. And um, um, because of the packaging, etc., that they can use, it also uh, um, brings them much more triggers to uh, to work on earned media exposure. But that's something we will uh, um, come back to in one of the following slides. Also, with regard to the media as an ecosystem, um, we should understand that, well, um, as much as we talk in Feast and other related projects about the food ecosystem, media also has its own ecosystem. And again, much like with any ecosystem that has um, many different stakeholders, we should understand that uh, there's often um, tensions in that system and kind of an imbalance. And imbalances, imbalances in such a systems thinking approach are often um, uh, solved at the very local level. So you, what you often see is that there's an imbalance in a system where um, only one person, one stakeholder wins, which was, for instance, the lose, 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 win, where Anand referred to in his um, opening statements in the food ecosystem, while well, same things are happening in the media ecosystem. Now, just to sketch this very well, this is a, this is a very, uh, 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 this is the smallest representation you can have of this media media ecosystem because, of course, there's many more stakeholders involved. But the, just to give you a short sketch, well, media need consumers, um, of course. Why do, do they need consumers? Well, we think because they uh, like us so much that they want us uh, to be uh, consuming their media. But, of course, they uh, m most of all need consumers in order to attract advertisers. In some uh, instances, the advertiser is basically the government uh, that pays for media, but in many other instances, it's um, um, real advertisers that pay media and they will only pay media to a considerable extent if they have a considerable consumer audience. Why? Because advertisers want consumers and the only way to um, to find them if they're not on your own media is to hire media, other media, and to pay these media. 
So everyone has stakes in this system. And um, well, because media are dependent on this business model, they don't always make, make strategic choices that are um, um, in favor of their consumers. Just like in any system, the tensions are sometimes solved in a, in a way that it mostly benefits the media or advertisers and the media. By the way, there's also a very interesting, uh, quite recent uh, stream of papers coming from, for instance, um, uh, researchers like uh, Bernstein, that also uh, suggest that there's something weird going on with these media and some of the advertisers, and uh, that's called what that's what they called a product market trap. For instance, with regard to media, uh, there used to be media that we really wanted, but um, quite recent findings show that, for instance, for a lot of social media, people actually say that they would prefer that they weren't be there. And that's a, a product market trap um, in the sense that, well, we, for instance, young people are now increasingly saying that they actually don't want TikTok to exist, but, but because everybody's using it, they feel as if they cannot bail out because if, if they would do so, then uh, they wouldn't wouldn't know what others are uh, doing in their lives. So they, they should keep on investing in these media, which is, of course, uh, good for these media because they can then uh, attract advertisers. And the same is true for some of these advertisers. <laughs> there too, we uh, see that some of the products are also product um, market traps where the products do exist, but basically consumers don't want them. But because everybody's using them, you should be also using them. Um, so that's already a, a very um, well cultural approach, you could say, to um, both media and advertisers from the consumer perspective, where we keep on consuming, even though we don't want that, um, in essence. And this brings us to, um, well, food culture and marketing strategies. I think um, Atsuko's presentation was um, certainly about uh, the part where food culture um, um, is a means also of expressing worldviews and belief systems. I think in my presentation, I'm more focusing on this, er this earlier part of the definition that comes from a paper uh, from Cairns in 2019, where uh, she described food culture as an umbrella term for socially accepted values, norms, and practices regarding food purchase, provisioning, preparation, and consumption. It's, uh, it relates to habitual behaviors, eating patterns, etc. So I'm also very much talking about these much more um, implicit things. And of course, also food nationalism has some explicit characteristics and implicit characteristics. But um, I think with regard to food marketing, we can mostly say that things fly under the radar. There's an, an, an an effect from um, marketing and media strategies on our food culture that mostly goes unnoticed and that only in retrospect or when looking at it from an outsider's perspective, for instance, from another cultural perspective that we notice that something is going on here. Um, <clears throat> okay. So turning now from this general setting of what media and the media strategies could be paid, owned and earned media. Let's look at the effects on people, on individuals. Well, why first look at uh, look at the individuals? Well, that's because um, in all honesty, if you look at uh, all research, there's uh, more than two decades of research on individual micro level effects. Um, and there's not a lot of research on collective cultural um, macro level effects. So this is truly a gap in, in literature that we need to fill. And that I think that um, the, that this void is also uh, certainly within, the, well, it's within the ambition of projects like Feast and other projects to, to really fill this void. Um, but still, well, what can we learn from all the, the research on individual effects? Well, more than two decades of research teach us that there's a lot of individual effects. Um, just take, for example, this meta-analysis by Emma Boyland and her colleagues, um, which is a very basic, basic effect that you can uh, can study. Um, so it's a meta-analysis about a very basic effect. What What is a basic effect? It's a one-time exposure to marketing or advertising, having an effect, an immediate effect on uh, food uh, behavior. Um, 
why is this the most basic effect? Well, most advertising, marketing and media strategies don't bother with individual single exposures. Media effects are all about um, massive exposures, about reach, about frequency of exposures. And it's also much more than only a direct focus on direct consumer behavior. Uh, it's a focus on attitudes, cognitions, long-term uh, behaviors, repetitive behaviors, etc. So if, uh, when Emma Boylan then found out that uh, at least for children, there's uh, already a, a, well, quite reasonable effect size that um, these uh, single exposures do have an effect. That was a, um, well, it wasn't a, a shocker for researchers, but it should be a, a shocker for society that even in these very uh, limited kind of circumstances, there is an effect already. Now for adults, there wasn't an effect, but for instance, in our own study that we did um, a couple of years later on adolescents, we did find that for adolescents, so up until the age of 18, the effect was similar uh, to what Emma Boylan found for children. So a, uh, let's say, um, medium effect size, uh, already for a single uh, exposure. That means that, well, if you would be happy about uh, adults having no effects, well, uh, you should think twice also, because um, if this is not a single exposure, but repetitive exposure, then there's much research showing that indeed this has an effect. And turning to, um, uh, oops, turning to uh, the social cultural effects, there are of course a couple of studies um, uh, that did uh, focus on this and what these studies uh, consistently found was, well, consistently uh, in the evidence that we do have, what these studies found was that there are a couple of um, effects. For instance, we see that there's category effects that um, um, marketing, communication, media strategies do have an effect on how much people purchase certain categories, uh, certain food categories. So we, we clearly have evidence, anecdotal and also more systematic um, research, that certain product categories became much more popular due to media strategies. We know that um, there's social norm effects, that some people, uh, well, that people perceive um, norms within society around food that are driven by media strategies um, 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 about food. We see that there's also social learning effects um, where people um, uh, have a consensus, for instance, about novel foods, that they're good or bad. Uh, for instance, uh, consensus norms about uh, about fast food, but also consensus foods, uh, consensus norms about um, um, genetically modified uh, organisms, where you see that there's even differences between uh, countries that are driven by media strategies within these countries. Um, there's also ripple effects, for instance, um, that uh, media strategies um, um, resulted in uh, some foods being called fun foods and others not, um, that we um, uh, that, that we think that some information about food is uh, perceived to be more credible rather uh, uh, than other information being perceived uh, uh, rather, uh, well, less credible. So we do see that there's cultural um, uh, collective effects also of media strategies uh, on uh, societies or on subcultures within societies. Just to give you a couple of very tiny examples uh, to demonstrate uh, well what exactly these individual subtle effects can be um, uh, just here two pieces of our own uh, past research just to show you how deep this can go um, so in in uh, in one set of studies we messed around with suggested uh, portion sizes so this is on the right here you see your your average um, breakfast cereal kind of packaging that typically features a very large bowl. Um, on average, by the way, that bowl features uh, something that visually seems to be three times larger than the tiny print suggests that a portion size should be. Just reduce, reducing that portion size or that image, I mean, the portion size is here the same, but reducing the image like we did on the left reduces the, the consumption, granted it was among kids, by 25%. Um, in, a, in another study, the one with uh, Lauren McGill and Emma Boyland, um, we did this uh, with, an average, uh, with an actual reduction of the portion size as well, as well and we uh, found even stronger effects. 
Uh, so an actual reduction of the visual portion size. And then if we turn to actual portion sizes, this is also quite a shocker. Uh, so um, in an experiment when we give participants either a small uh, portion versus a large portion of popcorn, you can expect that there's some effect of um, the quantity that you present people because indeed there is this well, explicit but mostly an implicit bias that we like to clean our plate or that we think it's actually even not um, uh, not socially desirable to only eat a little bit because it's well, uh, that's uh, your uh, um, uh, well, it seems as if you don't like the offer you get, something like that. Um, of course, appetite should be your driver rather than um, how much you you are presented with, and that's exactly what the shocker is in this study. If you present people with a larger portion size of unappetitive popcorn, so for instance, for children, salty popcorn, or, or for adults, stale popcorn, rather than fresh popcorn, then they apparently eat more than what they eat from the delicious um, smaller portion size. So it's not your internal appetite that is the main driver of how much you consume, it's mostly how much you see in front of you because you even eat, well, of course, in the larger portion size, people tend to eat more from the, um, uh, the, the um, appetitive uh, popcorn rather than the one that they don't like that much. But uh, this difference um, is quite small in comparison uh, to the difference between this darker gray bar, bar so the, the not so uh, pleasant popcorn, popcorn compared to to the, the two smaller portion sizes. So these are really um, uh, deeply ingrained um, implicit effects that we have. Now, where are these effects situated? So from a media strategy point of view, it's, it's quite interesting to think about, well, is this actually a democratic um, um, equalization kind of force, a media strategy? Is this something that we can also use to then promote healthy foods so why not just turn the tables around and do the same for healthy foods then that's something that we try to do quite a lot in our own research in the past or is it actually only um, helpful for the the larger companies are you normalizing existing imbalances within the food ecosystem well for traditional media there's a bit of a mixed message here uh, for traditional media uh, clearly paid media advertising uh, is a normalizing factor where economy of scales is playing um, it um, reproduces and reinforces actually existing imbalances where the rich become richer because they have the advertising uh, money to spend and uh, the well, not so rich, healthy, uh, raw foods, for instance, don't have the advertising money to spend. On the other hand, uh, owned media are a bit different within different within that uh, traditional approach because um, just investing in a lot of time, um, educating people, um, talking to people, etc., um, does also have a quite good return. So if you can invest time, effort. Um, from a credible source, you can, in a traditional media approach, see a little bit of, an, of a democratic um, 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 impetus or dynamic within, within the media system. However, in digital media, which we are confronted with for now, let's say, uh, uh, two decades, um, and the last decade, it's uh, at an increasingly fast pace. Um, we can see that many of these digital media start from the perspe perspective or ambition to be a very de demo democratic um, um, power. Uh, they all have nice ambitions in the beginning. Uh, and in the initial business model, they also in, in typically um, attract a niche market of innovators, both on the consumer side and the brand side. So typically smaller social media startups, etc. you see that they, they do a good job. Um, so you could say, but once they mature, they then suddenly become a business. They be, they adopt a traditional media business dynamic, which then results um, in normalization of existing imbalances because they they have a lot of reach. They also need to have reach to survive as a business model. Um, 
And then again, you get the traditional dynamics where the rich become richer and uh, that economy of scales uh, happens. There's some evidence um, on this matter from coming from communication science. Uh, actually, the, the domain where this has been researched most often is within political marketing, where we indeed see that in digital marketing nowadays, um, the larger political parties are actually the ones that profit most from um, all of the, um, well, the opportunities that digital marketing offers them. So this is again, um, bad news, so to say. Then turning to this digital marketing and food, because we can easily understand that um, social media is, for instance, a polarizing factor within politics. Well, I also want to uh, bring across the idea that it's a polarizing factor when it comes to food and food cultures. Um, turning to our own research again, um, we, uh, we, well, I'm going to talk you through uh, two studies that we did on, on, on this topic, where in the first study, we we ask adolescents to uh, keep a diary uh, with screenshots of what they saw in terms of foods on social media. So for, um, I believe, a period of 10 days, we asked them to, every time they saw foods on their social media, to take a screenshot of these, um, of these foods and then send them to us uh, at the end of the day and answer a couple of questions. Um, what we saw was a shocker for us because if we look on our own our own social media, we might see a couple of unhealthy things and then a couple of healthy as well. But we saw a lot of unhealthy stuff uh, because even though it's the same social medium, um, these adolescents see a different version of that social media. Uh, Forty-six percent of all the posts that we saw were branded, and then many of you might think like, "Oh, so these are all ads?" Well. That's not true because many of these, these posts were actually earned media. And here we again see some part of the food culture um, um, coming true. I mean, of course, some of these things were ads. Some of them were, for instance, influencer ads. But what these influencer um, marketing techniques have, have also done is that they um, created a culture, an online food culture, where people, you and I, and certainly also adolescents, are mimicking what these um, uh, influencers are doing. So we now see that a lot of adolescents um, and other users of social media are acting as if they're like very tiny micro influencers. They're copying the, the style of these posts and also mentioning brands. Um, what we also saw was that um, these media are indeed um, polarizing in the sense that, um, <clears throat> well, if you, well, we made a dis uh, distinction between core, what we call core foods, so the healthy stuff you could say, and the non-core foods. Um, non-core foods were cert certainly in the majority. Um, we saw um, only a couple of core foods, um, comparatively speaking, and interestingly also, what falls in between, like, rather healthy is mostly absent so it's really polarizing you see either very healthy stuff and then a lot of very unhealthy stuff and nothing like dull in between also interesting again referring to these portion sizes that i already referred to when it's healthy foods we often saw quite regular portion sizes but this flipped when we we talk about non-core foods there we saw that a tiny majority at least was of an excessive portion size, but a tiny majority being an excessive portion size, meaning that these were a lot of cal calories that we were looking at. Yeah? Um, the branding is also much more prominent in the non-core foods than in the core foods, um, uh, which is reflected here. And also the non-core foods are uh, somewhat more as a social thing rather than core foods, which were much more individual. Um, so one third of the core foods were in, uh, posted in a more individual setting, uh, two thirds in a, um, uh, uh, so, uh, uh, no, one third was in uh, approximately in a social setting, two thirds in an individual setting, where it was 50-50 for the uh, non-core foods. Taking these data to the next step then is the question like, um, Okay, but on the one hand, you would have this exposure. What about the effects? Okay, second study, a large-scale survey where we asked about 1,000 adolescents 
to report how much they saw um, core foods on social media versus non-core foods. And also we, uh, we then asked uh, things like descriptive norms. So how much do you think others are eating this? Injunctive norms, how much do you think you should be eating it yourself? Um, food literacy, how good do you understand food? And then uh, food frequency questionnaires, like how much do you want to eat uh, things uh, in the future? A couple of highlights here. Um, <clears throat> adolescents, luckily, knew that um, core foods are healthier than non-core foods. Um, they luckily knew that they should be eating core foods rather than non-core foods, which is the injunctive norm. But the descriptive norm is that they believe that everybody, or at least a, <clears throat> a larger majority, was eating non-core foods, so the unhealthy stuff, rather than the core foods. So here you already see that things are flipping around. They know what they should be doing, but they think that everybody else, or that at least a large majority, is doing something else. Looking at the data that we then found with regard to the relations, the more people were exposed or reported to be exposed to non-core foods, the more they also believed that others were eating this, and the more they then also wanted to eat that themselves. We see a little bit of an effect on injunctive norms, no effect on food literacy. So this means the more you see unhealthy stuff on your social media, the more you think others are eating it, the more you want it yourself. Okay. Let's now look at core food. Um, so the healthy stuff. The more people see healthy stuff on their social media, the more they understand what good food is. And also there's a, a little bit of an effect on consumption of healthy uh, foods. But these effects are smaller. Moreover, um, what we also saw is that they don't compensate for the unhealthy stuff in these other intermediate variable, variables. It's not that if you see more things, more core foods on your social media, that you also think that others are eating them more. Well, we could already imagine that based on what I uh, said two slides ago, that the core foods are mostly posted in a um, uh, in, in a solitary kind of um, setting rather than in a social setting. So you don't really have that dynamic, oh, everybody's eating healthy, I should do that as well. Moreover, we have a dose response issue. Um, here, it still seems as if it's kind of an okay relationship. So the more we expose people to core foods, the more we can expect at least some healthy effects but there was a much more massive exposure or at least self-reported exposure to um, non-core foods and to core foods. So if we want to compensate, if we really think that we should just copy Amazon, so to say, which is um, in marketing, it's called the just copy Amazon fallacy. It's like if you want to uh, be the competitor, just, uh, well, the fallacy is that if you just act as if you're the market leader, then probably the market leader will... Uh, will survive and you won't. So we, from a core and sustainable foods perspective, if we just try to copy that, well, it's unsustainable because we don't have the investment to have the, the similar dose uh, as the uh, non-core foods. Uh, it would mean a massive increase in core foods uh, online, or we should find some kind of regulation or policy to decrease the unhealthy foods. There's, by the way, also a massive cultural language bias um, in the way we talk about foods. Uh, for instance, in a quite recent study, which is really a, a very impressive one, I think, from Turnwald and colleagues, it's demonstrated that in a wide range of different types of communications, both uh, professional communications like TV shows, movies, but also the, the real earned media, um, um, consumer reviews, recipes that we post online, etc., um, people really have this unhealthy equals tasty bias um, and vice versa, healthy equals untasty. So people really think about healthy foods that they are um, dull, boring, etc. Which is a massive, massive kind of um, burden or disadvantage if you want to promote um, healthy core foods on social media. Now, looking at it from the little bit of the bright side that we can still do, um, that exposure to core foods 
resulted in increased food literacy, and that food literacy reinterpreted could be a cornerstone of how we can approach it, how we can build a media strategy for healthy foods um, in line with what, uh, for instance, uh, the, the feast ambitions are. Um, food literacy is part of our socialization. We have typically in research considered this to be a very individual trait where people who know how to eat should also then act accordingly. But it is in essence a kind of a social characteristic. And related to, for instance, how Richard Peterson uh, terms, uh, um, coined the term uh, cultural omnivorousness, we can also look at how food literacy as part of a cultural um, um, uh, capital kind of ID, so rather than economic capital and real cultural capital in the sense that you know, um, well, various books and, and uh, music et, and etc. tastes and you combine them in, into a high cultural elite. We could also look at food cultures in a very omnivorous kind of uh, setting and try to educate people collectively, but there should be a shared responsibility between all stakeholders uh, to uh, uh, to leverage that food literacy in order to uh, get to a better media system where food cultures can really um, 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 flourish rather than what we now see that food literacy is actually degrading decade after decade. Okay, so this is a kind of a a uh, very um, uh, dark picture that I first sketched, but I try to end with just a little bit of hope. For your reference, there's a couple of um, links here, uh, a couple of uh, references here that you can uh, consult if you want. Um, and that's it on my side. So I'm curious whether there are questions. Thank you so much, Tim, for the for the presentation. I think there is uh, one question that it's a little bit uh, almost, let's say, um, unavoidable. And it's uh, so in this context that you picture, it seems a little bit that we are the David against the Goliath. And so the question here is, how can uh, the locally sourced, the small uh, food brands use this principle to persuade consumers towards uh, healthier and more sustainable um, consumption of uh, yeah, consumption habits, and especially yeah, in this food marketing context. So, is there a way that it, we it can be done? Can something be done in this context? Um, yeah, of course, an unavoidable question, um, and one that uh, we've been struggling with for at least ten years, I think, in our own lab as well. Uh, uh, I think what we, for instance, now are, are doing in a, in a couple of the experiments, so we also follow up these surveys with experiments, um, is, is also interesting and might be worthwhile digging in even more. Um, that's, well, what we basically found was that um, people lack the skills to, um, to talk about healthy food in a very um, appealing way. So, um, in one experiment that that I still think is is uh, is is quite was quite impressive, we actually asked adolescents to uh, post healthy foods, and we were wondering ourselves like, but how can we actually just ask? I mean, are they are they going to take a picture of an apple every day and then just post it online? And what we saw there was that for some reason some of these participants started to get very, very creative in posting actually very cool stuff with healthy raw foods. Um, and that triggered us into, well, maybe that's all we need, a way to talk about basic ingredients rather than all the, the fancy food porn that we see or the, the ultra processed hamburgers and pizzas. Maybe we just need uh, cues and clues on how to talk about food to one another in a way that it's very, very appealing. And that is probably what we collectively should do. And um, in response to your question then, or the question that you articulated, I don't think that this should be something that's, uh, that we can expect from every small company. This is something that we collectively would need to do, because what I've also seen too much in health communication and certainly with regard to food, is that um, all the good ones 
all want to bring across their own version of the good message. And I think that that is a, a, a mistake that we've made all too often. We should we should collectively have a shared mes message and then all the good ones together are a big one. Uh, so collectively, if we have one message that is a clear message uh, for uh, the general audience, then that one will probably get a lot of attention and the attention that it needs. Thank you so much, Anand. Uh, yeah, I always have questions, but does, if, is there anybody else? Because we always have access to Tim. So if there are other questions, please go for it. Uh, are there any other questions, Samala? Yes, go? there is one, and it's um, how do we see multiple information flows? For example, chefs to influencer, influencer and nutritionists be seen as good opportunities to empower literacy and shape food cultures better align with health and sustainability. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, well, that's an interesting one, and I think it, it relates to what I what I just said. Um, I think they they surely um, have the leveraging leveraging power to um, to have good effects. But here too, you often see that they uh, want to bring across their own version of the good story. So, um, uh, for instance, what we um, what we did in in Flanders when we a couple of years ago launched the new food based dietary guidelines was um, rather than just launch these and then see how all the food chefs and influencers would react to that and then think and then would probably react to it in, in a sense that well they would likely disagree because of the small difference with their own message we approached them proactively um, and we talked it through and we tried to find a common story where both of us uh, got the better of it i mean um they could use they they could use their insight into the their um uh, their insight into the the uh, food-based dietary guidelines they well we gave them a, a preview and they could then use that to already think about how it fits with their story and at the same time they were then promoting afterwards the food-based dietary guidelines so i think we should find commonalities rather than just hope that there's a couple of good influencers out there that will do the, the right thing. Um, we should much more proactively um, um, make them uh, communicate along the same lines, I think. Okay, I was uh, now questions are, are flowing. I was trying to um, to check, I think one that is very interesting uh, also from uh, from my side. It's really how can you uh, regulate the impact of the social media personalities? So, for example, the the influence have upon uh, people's food choices, especially young people. Uh, for example, uh, the prime drink, uh, where people uh, were quoted saying they weren't so keen on the drink but wanted to feel closer to their uh, favorite influencers. And I think it's here, I, I will add a bit uh, a personal one. It's like, is there also a, an ethical conundrum in some of these nudging in a way that, uh, so for example, with influencer, is that something that uh, should be avoided because the mean itself, it's not ethical and we should go there. I think it relates a little bit to the democratization you, you mentioned before. Is there a conundrum that we would impede this nudging? Yeah, um, yeah. Um I uh, have very mixed feelings with regard to influencer marketing. I, um, um, I of course understand that it, it also links to free speech, etc. I mean, the 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 boundary between uh, when something is free speech versus when it becomes influencer marketing is not always as sharp as we would want. And uh, that's one reason why I think it's actually much more convenient to have traditional advertising rather than influencer marketing. I mean, with traditional advertising, you clearly know that this is a medium, so it gets paid. And, and um, um, for influencers, it's not always a sharp. Um, and um, yeah, I do think that we need much more regulation. And one of the problems with regulations of influencer marketing um, is that it's... Um, well, influencer marketing doesn't care about country boundaries, but regulation does. So we see that um, 
there's this constant fight like but it's allowed it there but not there and then the rules change a little bit but not too much and then if if there's a country that has very strong rules against influencer marketing then of course what the influencers will do is well play their trick cards which is influence so they uh, they know how to um, uh, get, create some uproar about uh, among their followers so it's it's a very difficult one um, what I also think uh, that is, um, well, not helping is that we can have this discussion about every social medium and then we probably forget one or two or three that are massively important in a niche market and that and where there's still kind of the, the wild west going on. For instance, nowadays um, uh, on Twitch, the, the live streaming plat uh, video, plat uh, video game platform, um, where uh, the, the research of Becky Evans from Liverpool University was quite impressive to see how how bad things are going there. Like for every 60 minutes of video streaming, uh, there's 50 minutes of food, most of it being um, energy drinks. Ironically, energy drinks that are considered to be healthy by the UK standards because they don't contain sugar, but they contain so much caffeine that it basically gives you a heart uh, attack. So it's a, well, it's a very complex issue. Uh, again, from a media strategy's point of view, it's adding stakeholders in the system and every stakeholder added means more complexity, more difficult to regulate. Okay, thank you so much. I think one last question and then we'll move to, to Lorenzo. And again, I'm trying to read all of them, but uh, there are so many. So I think it, we can conclude by, in a way, um, there is also so this point of accessible is there something that we so we need to to regulate but in a way so the, the other aspects so we were talking now about the nudging of the good ones but really the regulating of the bad if we can uh, oversimplify in this and so for example is the uh, and i'm drawing on one question the only solution to consider these unhealthy food uh, uh, like tobacco for example so ban all the advertising on taxis uh, uh, no advertising taxis uh, packaging so is this the only the only solution or uh, or do you see sort of a, a midway if it makes sense um, <laughs> um, also very tricky question um, I understand where it's coming from. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if within 20 years we would see plain advertising on some of the very unhealthy um, uh, stuff, but um, I don't think it will be happening that soon. What I am actually quite surprised about is still how much um, leeway there is in how you present your brand and how you uh, present your packages it's quite uh, quite shocking to see that we've regulated at least for for children under 12 and it's the the, the um, age boundaries are increasing in some countries for instance also in belgium uh, but for children under 12 we regulated quite a lot of advertising um for unhealthy foods and then the question is what is an unhealthy food uh, so th there's also some discussion and lobbying around that but it's mainly for the traditional media but not for packaging and that is what really is quite shocking there's um, a lot marketing of marketing and branding also purposefully misleading branding and marketing that can still happen on packaging which is always in your face when consuming products um, so in the long term in terms of uh, food culture effects that's uh, something that i think we should be focusing on <laughs>